All right. Thank you for coming. Uh, so this is an additional lecture to the lecture series. Um, we're very happy to have uh, Anton Savov from uh, University of Darmstadt, where he is currently a, a research associate. Oh, sorry. At the digital design unit. Uh, so Anton believes that everyone on the planet could co-create their built environment using games and digital fabrication. Uh, that's what that aspiration is. What drives Anton in his work um, as a research associate at the digital design unit. Uh, so he, he initiated this platform called twenty called twenty thousand blocks as a means for collaborative architectural design. Uh, previously to that, Anton has worked at Bollinger and Groman Engineering and taught at, I don't know if I can pronounce this, but the Stadtschu architecture class. Uh, he was also uh, previously a, um, a fellow at the Max Center in Los Angeles in 2012. Yes, so he's uh, no stranger to Los Angeles and uh, we're very happy to have him here. So uh, please welcome Anton. Thank you, Sushi, and thanks everyone for involved in organizing this last minute addition to the lecture series. I'm really excited to show recent projects, but also projects from, the, from my stay in LA and uh, related to that. So these are the slides which I think uh, we can move on. Yeah, so I'm currently a research assistant in uh, the digital design unit at the TEO Darmstadt, uh, which is uh, led by Professor Oliver Tessman. We are six, seven researchers all together and investigating how robotic fabrications, digital, digital technology, um, computation in general will change and affect the whole, cha the whole chain of ideation to design to building in architecture. And in parallel, uh, AWARE is kind of an experimental playground, not really an architectural practice as such, as more like a, um, a label under which to, to put experiments of engaging inhabitants and non-architects non in the design process. I always like to show where I come from, uh, the city I, I grew up with, just because I believe that both the natural and the built environment contribute significantly to who I am, and I believe that they contribute, the environments that you spend time in also contributes uh, to who you become, and that's why architects have always played an important role. They, they're shaping the built environment and with skill, sensibility, acquired to practice is, uh, is important, uh, the work that's done. And our profession is, is a tacit knowledge profession. It's, uh, it's a uh, practice that you need to do it many times in order to understand how to do it. It's not something that you can learn from a textbook. You have to actually practice it a long time. And that's very specific. Uh, this also um, responds to the responsibility that architects have, but also the specificity, this tacit knowledge basis is what puts architects in danger uh, today when we are facing enormous challenges I've uh, recently uh, looked at the agenda of the World Design Congress in Montreal and just took a few of the implied challenges that, that, they, um, that they referenced. So we need to design new uh, and, and promote them as well, new uh, housing models to respond to climate change and affordability. Four, four billion people in the next 35 years will, will move or be added to the cities worldwide, not just developing countries. And um, usually architects have been mediators, catalysts, catalysts and educators, and today they have to do and find a new way to do that in a society which is bombarded with information from everywhere. And also recently statistics have shown that 95% of the buildings in the world are designed without architects. So basically what I'm looking for is how could we uh, empower those 95% of cases to produce great results? And we definitely have a reason to, to do that, because if you look at traditional methods, which uh, deal with, I mean, every design process is an exchange of information, and you increase the density of inhabitants, traditional methods start uh, starts to fail, because the exchange of information you have to do is just 
huge between one designer and many inhabitants. So what I'm looking at is this uh, uh, concept called crowdsourcing, where you engage um, a larger community that not necessarily are experts and not necessarily are stakeholders in the design process, and they become contributors to the design. So the relationship there, many to many, is, is much better than one to many in the classical way we do design. So today, just to kind of um, bullet point what's, what follows, this is what I want to um, touch upon is, first we'll see what crowdsourcing is, and then through case studies I'm doing currently uh, for, my, for my PhD, I'm pursuing at the university in Darmstadt, and also uh, work we've done with students and other projects, we'll see how I've been wondering, can architecture can be can architecture be crowdsourced? And then three points that surfaced along this way. And I really want to leave you thinking, OK, how and whether and in which phase ideation, design, or building uh, could we crowdsource architecture? So just a brief definition, crowdsourcing. Probably a few years ago, when you were logging on a website, you saw this form. And that's actually a crowdsourcing project. Google had scanned all the books uh, from the past that didn't have copyright. So they had images of all the pages, but they didn't know uh, which words are there, what kind of text. An algorithm was very, um, was not possible to do that because of the different fonts and so on, but it was able to distinguish what is a word. So with an algorithm, they split these pages into words and they were showing us two words. One, in that case, overlooks is something which they already know it's overlooks, so it's a control word. And the other one, which we know now it's morning, but they don't know it's morning, um, was shown there 50 times to 50 different people, and maybe 45, 46 typed morning, so they knew, okay, that's the word morning, and they, they could go on to another word. Um, I'll I'll show you also in more detail how that works, also with other examples. But the way uh, conventional expert-based practice works is that ex experts define the problem, then same or different experts find, solve, solve that problem and then apply the solution to the problem. What crowdsourcing does um, is that, yeah, maybe it's still the experts who define the problem, but then using computation, that problem is split into many small tasks and they are shared uh, on the, over the internet through a crowdsourcing platform accessible for everyone so that any one of us, doesn't matter expert or not, could just take one task and complete it. And then all these results uh, from the exchange with the crowd, they are collected by the same online platform and a reverse algorithm combines these micro solutions to the big one and then we have um, we have kind of a, a result that acts as a solution to the problem. In the case of uh, recapture, or that uh, login uh, example I was showing, yes, the problem is that we need to digitize the old books, and we can algorithmically scan them and split them into words. We show these words to people which type the word, and then we collect these words. And since we know where in the page they are, we can put them one after the other, and now we have a searchable, readable uh, book that we can also analyze and so on. After that project uh, completed, uh, it took probably two years to digitize millions of books um, with our help, uh, Google moved to, uh, for example, digitizing maps. So instead of a word from a book, they were showing us a, a cutout from Google Street View where you see the address of a building, which our algorithm cannot recognize, but you can. So 8001, you, you type that, and then Google Maps was getting better. And when that was done, um, Google used the same concept to crowdsource um, machine learning algorithms to recognize images. So these are just very basic examples of uh, a byproduct of, of, of an activity that we are doing for, a, for another reason that contributes and crowdsources uh, another uh, a problem. Um, Scientists have also collaborated with, uh, with game makers, for example, with the EVE Online game. Here you see just the game in itself. It's a spaceship, uh, space battle, uh, space exploration game uh, where in that particular screenshot you see a 21-hour battle that took um, in 2014 that 
uh, 7,000 people took part in it, and they, they were fighting for, for territory in space. But that's not why I'm showing you this. This is the reason I'm showing you this. Um, scientists collaborated with the makers of that game to create a, a, a secondary mission for the players, and they could choose to, to um, classify images of the human protein atlas. So just by spending a few minutes extra um, for each gamer, um, it took them, it took the scientists just two weeks to uh, collect 4.5 million classifications from all the gamers in that, in that game community. And they were able to distinguish images that they had, they had scanned and distinguish which kind of proteins are in that image. I'm no scientist myself to understand it. Uh, just from the screenshot, but if you were, uh, when I tried this uh, mission, you could hover over each of these hexagons and it was giving you hints how to classify what does a cytoplasm typology of protein looks like and what does a periphery protein look like. And it was pretty easy to actually complete several of these missions, um, which um, make contribute to your um, game score and also give you game resources which you can use for uh, buying spaceships and so on. Another example, more kind of creative, uh, less uh, classifying type of example, was the experiment that uh, Reddit ran on the 1st of April 2017, so this year. They just created a image, pixel by pixel, um, of I think 1,000 by 1,000 pixels, and everyone that that had an account on Reddit could vote the color out of 16 colors for one pixel every five minutes. So every five minutes you could change the color of one pixel. And what you see here is a is a time lapse of 72 hours of organized communities which were chatting with each other and saying, okay, we're gonna build the Mona Lisa. We're gonna we're going to make the, the blue spot, which is growing now from the lower uh, right corner, or, or the red inscription, which was a quotation from a game. Um, or we're going to make the German flag and the French flag next to each other. So there were, there were people, like I think when I, when, whenever you logged in while that project was running, there were 40,000 people online clicking one pixel per minute, and you see just by organizing, self-organizing themselves how um, you know, images occur and they start fighting with each other. So that's uh, this kind of inspirations uh, and technological possibilities is what, what um, excites me about trying, okay, how can, we, how can we take these principles and see whether architecture is possible to be made uh, with some of them uh, applying this community type, uh, community based participation. So one, I'm going to show you two projects that are very much related to my stay in LA uh, five years ago. One that I, the Project Avocado that I just, just did just before coming here. Um, it was, it was an experiment where you could log on to a website that, that I had created and adopt an avocado plant, set three parameters for that avocado plant. How much sun does it, do you want it to, to, to get? How much water do you want it to get? And how close to its neighbors it should be. And based on these parameters, the structure was growing um, over the, the days that the website was open. The structure that was then later exported automatically, laser cut, folded, and installed in a gallery in Frankfurt. And the organizational principle for this for the structure started with this way of uh, seeding an avocado plant, where you take the, the, the avocado seed and you put three toothpicks, Mercedes-Benz type of uh, configuration, and then just dip the lower part of the seed into water. And in two weeks, you have an avocado plant. Um, in my case, in a few months, I had 80 to 100 avocado plants in my, in my flat. Um, growing them for that for that exhibition, so that later on then we could make a photo of each one and then let people adopt them and set parameters for them. So here you see the the website interface. So a person has selected plant number four hundred two twenty seven, and then 
and then uh, you could set the parameters. This is how the parameters actually affected the position of the plant. The more sun you wanted to have, the higher in the structure it would be. The more water you wanted to have, the closer to a human standing, to the space of a human standing with a watering can, so kind of moving down to the center and to the periphery. And the proximity of neighbors actually determined the length of these um, rectangle, uh, these boxes. On the website, everyone could see uh, where other people are and where your name ended up currently. So you could go back and change the parameters. So you could uh, configure it as you like. Uh, you'll see later in a video uh, a little bit more interactive uh, visualization. So this is uh, what people saw for uh, about one week. And then at the end of the week, everybody knew that, okay, that's the deadline and the structure will be exported and installed in a gallery. And when you adopted the plant and you set the parameters for it, you could also share that on Facebook. Um, this is how the structure is built. Basically, each avocado plant was housed in the structure with one box and one kind of column with a terrace on top. So the 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 word terrace and column, of course, they are architectural because the whole experiment uh, for me was, okay, can we create a housing structure in a funny way, in a small scale, um, and in a way interesting for the people to participate. Um, so I used plants instead of calling it a, a residential building. So everything was exported and uh, the, the parts for each unit were laser cut and engraved with the person who owned that plant and the address where they ended up being. Um, and I think I have a short video that kind of sums up uh, what I've been showing you. One hundred and twenty people took part. And people that at the beginning it was people that I only knew, only people that I knew, like twenty, thirty of them, and then suddenly their friends started joining, and then their friends started joining, and then at the end, uh, when we installed, when we installed the piece in 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 the gallery in Frankfurt, and at the opening, people were there. It was really nice to observe them. Oh, that's me, and find find themselves, find their name, or find a friend of theirs, and this whole excitement of. Yeah, I contributed something to this project and uh, I co-created. Uh, it's what inspired me to, to continue further with this approach and ex explore more opportunities uh, to engage potential in inhabitants, but also people who are, like I said, not really direct stakeholders in a project, but just want to be part of something bigger. So the, ex the, the exhibition stood for two weeks and at the end, at the vernissage, people could just come pick up their plant and their, the housing that it, uh, that it stood in and just take it home. So everything then dissolved um, from digital to uh, materiality spread into the city. And that was kind of the, the, the starting or the ground on which the project I did six years ago in, uh, during my stay in uh, the Max Center in Los Angeles uh, called Box in a Cloud um, developed. It, 
I wanted to do something uh, with a very challenging aspect of architecture. So placing units in space is, of course, easy when you don't have to think about water, piping, and, and so on. So I, I directly addressed the subject of the bathroom, and you see the bathroom as a social network. Uh, bathroom is a, the, the room bathroom, or the concept of a bathroom is a relatively new thing. This is a photo on the, the photo on the left is from um, 100 years ago, where bathrooms in Germany just started being installed. Before that, um, such a room did not exist, so they, they didn't know how to really deal with that. And the photo on the right is a bathroom from today, again in Germany, uh, which is called a typical Frankfurter bath. So it's a Frankfurt type of bathroom where the, the, the bathtub is in the niche, in, in a bedroom or a living room or whatever. But here is a... Here is what I mean by it's a relatively new thing. If you check all the books that mention the word bathroom, you see that it starts like 100 years ago. Until then, it doesn't exist. And it was because there was no water piping, uh, and you had a bathtub somewhere in your home, and you had to boil and pour water into the bathtub every time you had to take a bath. So it didn't really matter where, whether the bathtub was in that room or in the other room. You had still had to do that physical work. And I found this example that in the Renaissance times in Italy, rooms were actually not called living room, dining room, or whatever. They were called a morning room and an afternoon room and a lunch room based on where the sun will be in that room, in that part of the day. So in the morning room, the sun is there in the morning. And people took the bath in the morning room or in the afternoon room, depending on where, where they preferred it with or without sun. And another part of the culture of bathing is that it's been through centuries always a social experience. There were this bath, bath in the cities where people went um, however often uh, they could uh, and just met other people, their fellows, and exchanged. So this is how I started thinking of this project. It, it had to be a participatory one, of course, but also the space that it created had to deal, uh, had to be flexible and also deal with that flux in and out of water. So collect water from the, from the environment, uh, contain it, filter the used water in the slab structures. Also, through the movement of people in, in, in the building, water could be transported and pumped uh, up, back for reuse, and so on. The whole space forms around the bathroom. And all these aspects of your relationship with, with the water were the main parameters that you had to set as a participant in this fictional um, residential uh, settlement in Los Angeles. So you could choose whether you want to be really a nomad in the, wild, in the wild, or you want to be in a cloud, so kind of share your space, or really in a box which means, okay, I had my own space and I'm surrounded by four walls. And then from this private, public, and semi kind of shared settings, you could also add or um, exclude uh, different types of relationship with the water you could have. Um, and that, all these parameters were then, the inhabitants were sorted based on them and then added uh, to a structure that was growing on a hill. I have, a, again, a short video that shows you how that looks in, a, in, an, in the interactive phase. I realize that text goes too fast, but you can find the video online if you're really interested in that one. Um, it was done five years ago, and the relationship of video and text was not really familiar to me back then. So that was accessible through a website again. You could choose to become an inhabitant, uh, kind of, of course, browse through what exists there, but then become an inhabitant, sign up, and see where you end up being. And it 
every, at every moment of your interaction with this interface, selecting the water options, you could see your daily water use, the amount of water you produce uh, to be filtered in reservoirs, and then how much do people need to walk in order to pump all that water up to your place. these tents around are the people who chose to be uh, living in the nature. They still got whatever bathtub fixtures or uh, water sinks they, or pools that they chosen and everything is connected uh, under the ground. So in both Project Avocado and in, in uh, Box in a Cloud, the contribution that the crowd gave, and they were a fictional uh, inhabitants of these uh, structures, is to feed information into a certain algorithm so that they, they could be organized in space according to a certain parameter. And that's uh, one way to go. Um, it actually has a precedent in the 60s from the work of Jona Friedman, who started thinking uh, with his uh, concept flat writer, started thinking about this direct engagement of inhabitants. Uh, but uh, what, what could be done more than that is uh, something that I started exploring with 20,000 blocks, um, now in the di digital design unit, where not only data is uh, the contribution to the, by the crowd, but also many different kinds of designs, um, different uh, instances of designs collected together and first of all created and then collected uh, as a body of work. So the example here is uh, the Habitat 67 in Montreal and it's being created by the, this player in just 10 minutes from 12 uh, different units. So it's exactly as uh, Habitat 67 is, uh, in, is standing now. But the idea, of course, is that w working with this catalog, with the concept of a catalog of units available to you, uh, you could start creating different combinations, but also start changing how these units looks, look and uh, experiment with that. The project, this uh, 20,000 blocks project, addresses the early phase of uh, architectural design, so just laying out of rooms and areas. Um, spatial organization, not really detailing of windows and uh, more, more detailed uh, design uh, tasks. The, uh, the platform is based on Minecraft, and what we, ex what we extended Minecraft with is uh, our scripts make it possible that you can place many blocks at the same time, this concept of, uh, of a catalog and elements in that catalog. Because original Minecraft is just, you can take or place one block at a time. Um, so if you thought my lecture is rather nerdy, um, <laughs> this is even more nerdier than that. Um, the whole project is connected through a computational routine that exports the, the designs created by players uh, to our robot arm, industrial robot arm, which then takes one block at a time, applies glue at the right sides of this block, and then places it into a model plate so that you could create something in, in the virtual environment and then see how it looks and behaves, most importantly, in the environment, in the physical environment. Because architecture is not only virtual, it has to also respond to uh, aspects of the 
uh, real world, not only structure, but daylight and, uh, and views and so on. So in 20,000 blocks, anyone could design uh, a building, get the model built. Uh, like I said, it's addressing early phase of the architectural design process, and it's built on Minecraft. And while doing that, I started thinking what, what actually is important when we are trying to engage the non-experts, when, when, when we end up with the whole community of people uh, contributing to designs. And of course, the first point which is important and also it's kind of why, why, it, why it's good to do that is to empower the people to express their own human values in their own built environment. Because when that's quite challenging, because values, uh, human values are not like uh, preferences or needs, which get um, addressed uh, much more easily. But the like attitude to nature, attitude to privacy, understanding personal understanding of aesthetics, or the attitude to the other members of society, these are things that don't directly relate to design or shapes or materials. And they're, they're much more subtle, and we as architects know about this stuff. We, we have done it, like I said, many times in order to understand, OK, how do I take that character of a person that stands, is talking to me now, my client, and uh, make a project that responds to them. But when we, when we want to encode that in a system that people themselves can interact with, uh, we need to see what, what's been done in order to encode the principles of architecture into open systems of rules. And these are three, three sources which, uh, which are quite important in this process for me. And they're all from the 70s for, for some reason. Um, so it's the time when information theory and computers are becoming a big thing. So architects also start thinking about that. But what Christopher Alexander on the, uh, with the, uh, a pattern language helps us understand is what actually is an element. And it's never a geometrical module that you put next to one next to the other. But the relationship is much more subtle. Uh, he describes uh, 300 patterns that occur repeatedly in architecture and in the built environment across the whole world. Um, so it's a very good starting point to uh, start thinking of a, of a catalog of, of elements. Uh, towards, I already mentioned that Jona Friedman was one of the first ones uh, in his book Towards a Scientific Architecture to start systematizing what collective designs for the inhabitants would look like as a process. And what Nicolas Negroponte started looking at is the computer as a tool, as an assistant to the architect, not just as a drafting tool, but how do we run checks for daylight? How do we run checks for structure? And give feedback to the architect uh, almost in real time as, as they are working. So this kind of approach uh, is also quite important. Because when you want to include the non-expert non as a rightful contributor in design, I think you need to, you can do two things. Basically, you can help them understand what actually happens in that process. And for that, we could use computational design and, and make things um, easy to understand, visual and interactive. And you can also create tools and environments, interactive 3D environments, which are based on a certain set of rules. So you can let them co-create and experiment. But these two things, they actually have to happen. Uh, together in order to create a loop of, okay, I did something and I see what that means and then I can change change what I did. Um, so what, what we did, for example, with, uh, with students uh, last, um, last term in, in the University of Darmstadt is to start with the premise that there are 1,000 designs for the same uh, house for the same client, 1,000 possible designs. And the several questions are occurring then. If you have 1,000 designs, is there a best one? And how would you as an architect choose one of them? And even more challenging is how would the homeowner uh, choose one of them without our direct engagement? So the seminar, the, the course, uh, asked the students to create an, anal an analysis routine for a set of floor plans to compare them according to a certain parameter, such as the views in the house 
or the daylight or the temperature comf comfort or um, the potential for solar gain and solar uh, power, cost of construction. They had to choose only one, create an, an analysis routine that actually worked in, in Rhino and in, in Grasshopper, uh, and then create a concept that displays these sorted plans and also the data that was generated by in the analysis phase. Uh, to a non-expert in an easy way so that they can understand. Here's an example. I'll introduce you to our view spots definition. It gets rather definition technical in the middle, the exterior and inter -views but it's a short one. Currently shown on the screen. Before using the definition, the input data needs to be prepared. Outline each room using closed curves to define the room boundaries and label the rooms according to their function. Make sure the left side of the text is in the room boundary. In the end, it should look like this. A second drawing needs to be done with the wall openings. It should look something like this. Before opening Grasshopper, make sure you set the absolute tolerance in the Rhino properties to the millionth. This is the view spots Grasshopper definition. Don't be intimidated by the size of the definition. You only need to operate the red section. So all these are available on our website. You definition. can download and try yourself. That's why we did the instructional video. Then reset the looping component and the data recorder. Choose the type of analysis. The one-point mode allows you to analyze the views of a specific point within the floor plan. You can manually choose whichever point you like in the floor plan. Each color represents a different type of view. The orange shades represent the interior views and the blue shades the exterior views. The 1000 point mode automatically analyzes the views of the entire floor plan based on a grid of many points. Click loop to start the analysis. Each point on the floor plan analyzes the different types of views and the result of each room are calculated. To display the heat map, activate this section. The first part of the definition collects the raw data for each viewpoint within the floor plan. This section performs the geometrical part of the analysis, which is then used to generate the numerical raw data. The second part takes the raw data and processes it to generate the heat map and the view connection diagram. The numerical results of the analysis are shown in the tables here. The values are calculated between 0, meaning no views, and 100, meaning full view. The view connection diagram displays the interior view connections through connecting each room button with a line and shows the amount of the connection through the percent value. The more interior view connections the room function has, the larger the button is. The blue around the button represents the amount of views to the outside, and the blue number is the percentage of the exterior views from that room. Lastly, the heat map gives an overall impression of the exterior views. The lighter the room is, the larger the building envelope's openings are. So the, the concept for the app that they showed is that it shows you the floor plan with the analysis data mapped onto it, but also this view connection diagram um, in the lower left and then on the Upper left, it shows the connection diagram of your preferences where you feel, okay, I, I, I like that I see my, from my kitchen that I see the front yard or I see the living room. So you kind of created a footprint of your ideal home without using any architectural language, just by setting preferences. And then it could find your match in the floor plan set that, close, that matches as close as possible to yours. Um, Another group, very quickly to uh, show you one, one or two more projects, um, took the light levels for each activity, like drinking coffee or taking a bath, reading a book, uh, and mapped the house with uh, the times of the day where, where the daylight was exactly within that, uh, within, within that span of, uh, of uh, brightness that matches this activity. This one, this group took the thermal comfort, so 
what is optimal to uh, as a temperature to have in the bathroom, which is different from the bedroom and which is different from the living room and the kitchen, and compared uh, the floor plans based on that and presented that to, like, developed a concept to this, uh, as for an app to present that to uh, a non-architect. Of course, within one semester, what was possible to focus on the more expert type of, uh, of the tooling, so the grasshopper components, and then for the app, it was just a graphical mock-up uh, sc um, sample screens, how, how that would work. So this, this kind of addressed the, this analysis uh, aspect of empowering the non-experts, so helping them understand what they are looking at. Um, in in 20,000 blocks, which I'm going to explain now how uh, briefly how it works, uh, we are looking at this uh, generative aspect of creating a tool where um, the non-expert can also uh, create designs. And it's based on a concept called shape grammars. So if you build, uh, like in, let's say rule one, if you build two blocks, a purple one and a blue one, and you stand on the blue one with your player character, those will be replaced by the shape uh, where the arrow points to. And that gives us another blue block around which we can place another shape. And the rule two, we're actually kind of closing, and kind of finishing the, uh, the building set. And, and then the shape that you get doesn't have a blue block anymore. So you can't expand that. And it's a very abstract illustration of, of these rule systems. Uh, so if you see that the player takes an action and intentionally chooses in which way to create this terrace uh, type of uh, structure, and then at one point they choose to stop that. With that same two rules, these are four structures that are possible to be created. And like I said, it's, it's a very abstract example, just as a rule illustration. But here we have a catalog of only six elements, and they are um, a slab which expands in four directions. There is a wall frame. I have this pointer. So a slab that expands in uh, four directions, a wall frame, a beam facing south, a beam facing north, a slab to the east, and a slab to the west. So the player needs to build this, stand on the blue block, and they get that one. And if they build this and stand on the blue block, they get that one. So this is what, what then players created, one of the many uh, things that was possible to be created with that uh, catalog. And like I said, there is this direct relationship between things being built in the virtual world and then the robot actually creating, creating them. So as a, as a participant in that project, you have two options. You could either be given a catalog by someone and start experimenting in different combinations of these elements. Or you can go here in that area and start changing these uh, shapes so that you can create your own, your own typology of uh, designs. For Habitat 67, this, is, this illustration a video that I showed you before is exactly what uh, we did. We took the 12 typologies of flats that the building consists, the main typologies that the building consists of, and then added them as a catalog so you, that you could create Great. This here's another example, a different one, from a conference uh, uh, where we exhibited the, the project in a conference in Sweden, 2016. And you see the players playing. This, uh, this is uh, one experimental ground with one catalog. Here in the background, you see a completely different one. So the, the possibilities for, for designs are, are quite open. But since, since uh, the, the people who participate are you, your friends, we even had a, a project which was targeted at, at uh, the younger audience, so also children. The second consideration, um, second point is quite important, and it's how do we start respecting and rewarding each valuable contribution to, uh, to, to the designs that we're collecting. We started thinking about that while working with um, institution in the city of Heidelberg, uh, which, which created, which initiated a process for redeveloping a, a whole uh, new neighborhood in Heidelberg uh, called the Patrick Henry Village. It was 100 hectare uh, of a territory 
uh, with existing buildings, but also um, to be newly developed. So what we created is a game targeting the younger audience, the younger inhabitants of the city, with, uh, with the goal to make them aware that, first of all, a project like this is happening, but also make them aware um, what does it mean to have a mixed-use neighborhoods, what does it mean to have single housing only neighborhoods, what does it mean to have tall uh, buildings in the city or huge parks and so on. So they, they could experiment by trying to achieve one of these goals to build the, the densest, the, the tallest, and so on neighborhood. And each of these square patches that constitute uh, the whole neighborhood, I think we had more than 300 play fields like that, um, could be played within 20 minutes of game time, could be, uh, could be co created by up to four players at the same time. And then it got recorded, and on a website you could see who built the neighborhood, what kind of buildings they used, which were the, the neighborhoods that you built. So the, the aspect of contribution uh, by player name, but also increasing your score by achieving something was important for us because we need to figure out some kind of a reward system or an incentive to participate in such a project. And this is important because if you, if you have a participatory um, economy, let's say, you can end up with, with two configurations, basically. One is this exponential distribution where you have a, a few very good leader uh, participants who are really at the top, and basically everyone else struggles to, to, to go there, but it's not possible. The, the, that's why this whole model is non-sustainable. As an example, think of performance music, musicians if you play once, you get paid, and if you don't play, you don't get paid anymore. So it, in a crowdsourcing platform, if you do something useful for us, for the company or for the architecture project or for whatever, if you stop doing that, you basically stop uh, gaining. This other distribution, which I found much better, is uh, the normal one, where you have that thick middle uh, mm, large number of players. And basically it is, if you do something useful now, you get rewarded, but that stays recorded. So every time an algorithm that, uh, the, uh, that runs the project, or every time basically your data gets used, you still get rewarded. And the equivalent, the example here is music royalties. If you write one tune and it gets played on the radio or in a commercial, you always get uh, paid a little. And that's a much more sustainable model to, to deal with. This whole uh, discussion of, uh, of the economy of participation is uh, very well described in the book by Yaron Lanier. Definitely recommend if you're more interested in that. Who owns the future? But basically, if you look at what kind of technologies are there to help us achieve uh, this thing in the middle, the normal distribution, it's uh, blockchain. Blockchain is the technology on which for, uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies run. And blockchain allows us to have automated smart contracts and distributed networks. So for a, for a society with crowdsourced production that definitely needs the tools to be working with this uh, concept of a smart contract. Um, open sourcing, for example, the tools and the data is not really enough. It doesn't make sure that that the information that you once contributed to a database, every time it gets used, uh, you also get a, a reward for it. And since we're speaking about production, my third and final point for today is that when, we, when we're dealing with this rule-based uh, environments for creating architecture, there's, they actually constitute a medium of uh, a virtual medium which we inhabit and we use to create. And the integration or the, the, the relationship between that medium and the, way, and the way that those designs will be built is important to be as tight as possible so that the constraints are shared between the real world and what's possible for the participants to, to actually create. Because if they end up creating something impossible to build, it's of no use to, to anyone. Um, so that's what, that was the reason why robotics 
and with, through the industrial arm robot was employed from the very beginning in the 20,000 blocks project. And this relationship between a Minecraft block and a wooden, wooden cube uh, glued together uh, was there present from the, from the very beginning. Uh, we can call that uh, voxel to particle. Voxels are these three-dimensional pixels of which uh, a 3D world is made out of. And then particle is, of course, something of which you aggregate and uh, create the models from. The whole process of building these, these models is actually is very similar to 3D printing uh, in a granular bed. So we, the robot is placing also non-glued blocks as a support. And once the model is done, this is how it, it looks to, to actually free the model uh, from all the necessary blocks that were just there for, for structural support while the glue sets. And they, they could be reused for, for next models and then you actually take it out. Uh, the aspect of modularity and digital uh, discrete assemblies is also um, addressed in the research of a, uh, in the research work of a fellow researcher from the DDU, Andrea Rossi, who is developing a whole library for Grasshopper to work with this rule-based um, understanding of combination between different modules. So in that, it's, it's uh, like I said, it's a Grasshopper plugin where you describe a geometrical relationship between different parts. You also model the parts in Rhino in that case. Um, and then I think this, uh, yeah, these are works that uh, he did in the previous term with students, uh, playing with that tool, creating modules which were grabbable by the robot. So they, they also try to <coughs> keep that relationship between virtual and physical. But like you see here, it's not just a cube anymore, but all kinds of modules are possible. <coughs> what, the, what the tool helps achieve is, <coughs> excuse me, is um, assist the designer in creating these aggregations of modules by using, for example, a topology optimization type of of, uh, of tooling where you could define these would be the areas in which the structure I would like to have are supported and these are the areas which the structure will be loaded. So this is the, how the forces flow in that space. And if I have these um, um, pyramidal-like units or octa octahedron-like units, the library automatically makes a configuration of them, attaches them one, one next to the other according to the rules you define, that matches as close as possible this uh, force field. You can also say, say, this is a surface that I would like to, to match or kind of repeat or build from the units, so it automatically grows uh, unit after the unit, the library grows for you. Uh, this kind of structures. This plugin is also available online. You could uh, get hold of it and experiment with it. Uh, these are just uh, further examples of one relationship extended to more complex ones and uh, possibilities that are uh, unlocking. This is how a module is then more, a more detailed version of the module looks like so that it is possible to attach them in a physical space, so it's not just stays in the computer, but also 3D printed or laser cut modules that can be attached by, by hand or grabbed by the robot and put together. And one last thing, um, kind of experiment by another fellow uh, researcher at the DDU, also dealing with that uh, interaction between the digital media and media in which we create and its direct integration to the physical world is the robotic bending um, seminar or course that uh, Bastian Wiebrenek, a colleague of mine, did at the DDU. The, the idea here is that a human defines the position of 
of these constraints and which also defines the shape that that uh, lamella or stripe will take in space. And at the other end, the same happens. So these were placed by someone. Then the robot equipped with a 3D scanner head and an understanding of what the point cloud that it sees uh, actually means, what kind of shape the stripes have, scans them and creates an interpolation from the one stripe across 20 other stripes to the uh, other stripe, so from here to here. And the projector matches that, so you actually um, have this augmentation of reality. The projector uh, displays that for you, and then together, human and robot, they're placing the sticks and the lamellas until the whole space is filled with, with the lamellas. So you see the robot is actually one step ahead here, is placing these constraints automatically. These ones were placed by a human, the blue ones by the robot. And then uh, the student here is uh, positioning the lamella between these constraints. So just one more type of experiment which we are running at the DDU, integrating the design media and the building the construction uh, processes. So this was kind of a broad view of uh, teaching experiments and uh, also uh, other kind of crowdsourced experiments. And basically, just to sum up, why, why at all do crowdsource architecture? Um, you can harness the wisdom of the crowd, and that's adding to uh, the wisdom of a team of experts uh, significantly. And you could also empower the, the people that are creating these 95% of the buildings in the world without being architects. It forces us as architects to also leave that tacit aspect of our practice and start to make it more transparent, more engaging, and understandable and approachable to others, and not um, uh, not be magicians and kind of have an inexplainable way of doing things. And the data that is actually created in the process, if, if we uh, have the design process happen in an in a online connected uh, platform, is recorded and can, we can use it to learn from previous solutions. And maybe that helps us address the bigger challenges of, of the built environment. Because if you think of how you how you do your projects in a in a today, probably you do a lot of sketches, a lot of uh, design solutions that you end up throwing out because you understand why they are not good, but that doesn't get recorded. So the next person maybe uh, working in a similar project will create the same solution and also figure out okay that doesn't work. Uh, so let's do something else. Let's place the bedroom facing the best view. Uh, for example, instead of the worst view. And these things uh, could be actually used, uh, could be recorded and used to, to make the process faster and, uh, and better. So yeah, I would like to leave you uh, thinking whether and how architecture can be crowdsourced uh, today. And if you wanna, if you don't find the things I showed you online, everything should be accessible online. Uh, 20,000 blocks, WASP, and the uh, floor plans seminar, all the definitions uh, for grasshopper should be online. If you don't find them uh, or have uh, a question, please email me anytime. Thank you. <laughs>